have not been given a spirit of slavery. Paul declares this message to the church at Rome, a church that was worshiping near the seat of power of the empire. An empire that claimed to be a democracy, but was in reality only a democracy for some. This week I spent time in the seat of power of our country, in Washington, D.C. Most of the week I was at Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church, where the likes of Fredless Douglas and Eleanor Roosevelt and Charles Wesley and Desmond Tutu have all spoken. It is a place that for generations people have sung out their praises to God, even in the midst of great adversity, sitting just a few blocks from the White House and the halls of Congress. As I sat there, I kept thinking to myself over our scripture for this week and asking, what is a spirit of slavery? So let's talk for a minute about that. What is a spirit of slavery? And by that I don't mean what is the spirit of a slave. When we look at those who have been enslaved in this country or used or misused or abused, we often find that despite the systems trying to break them, their spirits are stronger and more resilient and more tenacious than we could ever imagine possible because they have courageously and they have very defiantly refused to pick up that spirit of slavery being shoved on them. So what I'm asking is what is a spirit of slavery? What do you think? Submissive. What's that? Submissive. It's being told you've got to be submissive, right? Hopeless. Hopeless. A spirit of slavery is hopeless. Hmm. Anita. Not being able to be self-actualizing. Not being able to be self-actualizing. Interesting. Yes. Yes. What else? Sophia. I was for 38 years, and I was bound to cigarettes, and I was under that spirit of slavery. Okay. So you can be a slave to an addiction, unable to have agency maybe over your own uh, life. What else? Owned. Owned. Okay. Owned. Yeah, you're not your own. You're owned. And it's different, right, than when your spouse or your parent says they belong to me or with me, right? It's a different, different kind of ownership. Yes. You have few or limited options. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? of slavery, your own inner imagination, your dreams are shut down. Yeah. Well, here's what I came up with this week, although you have all added so much depth and breadth to what I came up with. The spirit of slavery wants you to feel like you have no control over your life or your circumstances or anyone else's, no agency to act. The spirit of slavery is the feeling of being stuck or trapped. The spirit of slavery demands you work out of fear, not love, out of despair, not hope. The spirit of slavery values profit more than your humanity. The spirit of slavery asks you to dehumanize yourself, your neighbor, or even your enemy. I don't know what in your life right now is making you feel that sort of spirit of slavery. What's making you feel trapped or stuck or forced to live in ways you don't want to or kept from doing what you feel called to do. I don't know what in your life right now is trying to tell you that you don't have agency over your own life or anyone else's. 
I don't know what's telling you that you are not free to love or to liberate yourself or others. Maybe you are scared of the future, and so you're holding back in your giving and your generosity. Or maybe you feel called to speak out against racism, but you're scared to potentially sever relationships or offend someone. Or maybe you feel called to advocate for one of the many groups in our country right now who are being attacked. School children scared of gun violence. Immigrant and refugee children that we've been hearing over the last few weeks more and more are being torn away from their parents, abused oftentimes by officers or the families that they are put into, and sometimes completely lost track of by the government. Or maybe women needing reproductive health services, or maybe gay and lesbian teens being forced into conversion therapy. The list of all the groups we could advocate for goes on and on and on. And maybe you are feeling called to some part of this advocacy, but you feel paralyzed into inaction, or quite simply feel ill-equipped and unsure what to do. All sorts of things can make us feel that spirit of slavery. When 1,700 preachers, predominantly from white mainline congregations, gathered at the Festival of Homiletics in D.C. on Monday, you could hear audible groans and sighs during the first several sermons and lectures, and not in protest of what was being spoken. It was more like this release. Why? Because many of those who were gathered there carried with them to D.C. a spirit of slavery. They felt enslaved by, trapped by, stuck in fear. Fear of preaching even the basics of the gospel, like love of neighbor, or tearing down the walls of hostility, or that the divine image is reflected in every single human being, especially the poor, the stranger, the imprisoned, the marginalized, the vulnerable. People arrived fearful of preaching that because in many of their contexts they might lose their job, their livelihood might divide their very purple churches, might ruffle too many feathers in their congregation. In an age when such basic tenets of the gospel have come to be seen not just as political, but as partisan. And some, of course, were very reasonably fearful because they have, in fact, received hate mail and death threats for honestly preaching what they feel to be the truth of the gospel, preaching Jesus. But preacher after preacher and teacher after teacher got up in front of us and they reminded us, you have not been given a spirit of slavery. You have been given a spirit of freedom, the very spirit of Christ, the spirit of adoption into God's family, into the human family. And they reminded us it's time we start acting like that family. We, it's time we start acting like we are siblings, like we are beloved children of God, like we are free, especially like we are free to love. And you know what? Despite so many of those in the pews being predominantly white, the speakers and the preachers at this conference were not. And that was intentional. Because the people who know how to live by the spirit of freedom and hope and not by a spirit of slavery and oppression, those are people who have been marginalized, whose people have been enslaved or treated as less than, who have known great adversity and who have walked through it or been carried through it by God. They were the people we needed to hear from. So we sat at the feet of these preachers and teachers being liberated and emboldened and filled with courage and hope and reminded of our agency. And each day in the room you could feel people's spirits rise a little bit more out of that spirit of slavery and into that spirit of adoption into God's family. 
and these preachers were right. It was time that we stop cautiously sitting on the sidelines and start acting like that family that has been grafted into God's family, like a human family. And so that's what we did. We said no to fear. We said no to being muted. We said no to the misguided belief that we have no agency. We said no to despair. And we said no to having the name of Jesus, the gospel of love, hijacked by Christians and by politicians in the media, who so often are not promoting anything that is at all in keeping or in line with the gospel. And we said yes to Christ. We said yes to a spirit of adoption into God's beloved family. And we said yes to our responsibilities, to our siblings in Christ, every human being on this earth. And we said yes to a spirit of freedom. And so, led by Bishop Michael Curry, who just a week ago preached at the royal wedding about the power of love, and led by Jim Wallace and Walter Brueggemann and Richard Rohr and a whole bunch of other famous theologians and preachers from around the country, we walked silently, peacefully through the streets of D.C. We were carrying candles and we were, each of us, praying. And when we got to the White House, with, of course, the permission of the um, D.C. police, we walked right out onto Pennsylvania Avenue. And facing the White House, we read a proclamation reclaiming Jesus. Now, I don't have time to read the entirety to you, but if you're interested, I did put a few copies on the back table in the sanctuary here. Here's just one short summary segment. We believe how we treat the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the stranger, the sick, and the prisoner is how we treat Christ himself. Therefore, we reject the language and policies of political leaders who would debase and abandon the most vulnerable children of God. We strongly deplore the growing attacks on immigrants and refugees. We won't accept the neglect of the well-being of low-income families and children. There were a whole bunch more of these. When our, our proclamation had been read, we said the Lord's Prayer and then we sang it, just like we do here at Good Sam every second Sunday when we toll our bell for peace. And finally, we sang this little light of mine. All of us swaying with our candles to the music as we sang. And as we did, I noticed something, that in, in the midst of all these flickering candlelights, there were these little red dots that would pass over clergy collars and stoles. I realized later those were sniper rifles from the White House. But we kept singing and we kept swaying. We did that because that's what slaves have taught us to do. From the Hebrew slaves who were escaping Egypt, to African slaves in the antebellum South, to African Americans in Jim Crow America. When the spirit of slavery is being pushed on you, forced on you, you don't pick it up. You don't let it have power over you. You don't let it get inside of you. When fear and intimidation circle around you, you don't yield. Instead, you sing. Instead, you dance. Bishop uh, Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder, a same-gender loving African-American UCC preacher who comes out of the Pentecostal tradition, and no, we don't have bishops, but that's a whole other story. She reminded us last week of the story of Miriam. Moses' sister, and how when the Hebrew slaves were coming out of slavery in Egypt and they got to the other side of the Reed Sea, they were not completely safe or secure yet by any means. They had not reached the promised land yet. And yet she danced. Just like Jesus danced in defiance of Rome and in defiance of the religious elite, she danced in defiance of Pharaoh. She danced just like the slaves in this country danced and sang in the evenings, even after 12 long hours in the field working. 
because if you pick up that spirit of slavery, if you pick up that spirit of fear, if you pick up that spirit of despair, then it owns you completely. You have to live like there is nothing pressing down on you, even when it is. W.E.B. Du Bois writes, There is in this world no such force as the force of a person determined to rise. The human soul cannot be permanently chained. Jesus, dark-skinned, poor, occupied, childhood refugee that he was, he understood this. The gospel understands this. It is the good news that we as the Christian community proclaim. On Easter here at Good Sam, we heard Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise, a part of which goes like this. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I rise. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from the past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and, swe and swelling, I bear the tide. Friends, if you weren't here last week and you didn't notice from our decor today, which is still up from last week, we have moved out of a season of Easter and into a season of Pentecost. It's that time in the church year when we remember that Jesus alone isn't the only one who can rise above adversity and live into liberation and bring the whole world along with him. Through him and by the power of the Spirit that he gives to us, we too have that power to rise as well. Jesus found power in the community and the love he shared with God, the Creator, and God, the Spirit. We too, friends, find power in our adoption into the family of God, the beloved community of God. The Reclaiming Jesus confession that we read on Thursday night in front of the White House acknowledged that we are living in perilous and polarizing times as a nation, with a dangerous crisis of moral and political leadership at the highest levels of our governments and our churches. During this time, may you reject that spirit of slavery. May you embrace that spirit of adoption into God's family, which binds you not only to God and not only to those sitting here in the chairs next to you in church, but to every human being on earth. And this week, may you live into that spirit of freedom and love with, with which you were adopted. May you sing and dance and pray and advocate and protest and love the kingdom of God into the world. May it be so. Amen. Amen.